Homestuck is a massively ambitious story that traverses as many forms of media as it possibly can. It's simultaneously a book, a comic, a cartoon, and a video game. It's a story about a video game, which is itself presented as a classic adventure game, speaking to the reader in second person and taking commands from them. It's utterly unique, and perhaps for that reason very difficult to talk about. People have a lot of trouble explaining what it is they actually like about Homestuck. In truth, there's a lot to like about Homestuck, and in this series I'm going to be trying my best to take the story apart and explain what those special qualities are piece by piece. The first part of this analysis will cover the broader mythology of the story as a whole, and analyze the role that computer science and software design paradigms play in that. I'm not going to discuss the plot in this part of the analysis. By that I mean I'm going to refrain from stating any specific things that happen in the story or actions taken by the characters, and none of the footage I use will give anything away in that department. That said, I will be going in depth with the lore and explaining details about the setting. In the case of world building, I don't think it's quite as important when someone has shown something, since the overall objective is not to hook the reader so much as paint them a picture. Execution is everything, and I think that a truly great story should be entertaining and engaging regardless of how much information you have on it going in. By that logic, I don't think that hearing what I have to say here will ruin anything for you. Rather, I hope to sell you on the story with this first section, by convincing you that Homestuck has merit to it besides surface-level silliness with which it presents itself. So, without further ado... Part 1. Mythology Building. Homestuck is a creation myth, a piece of software, and an ecosystem. If you ask someone what Homestuck is about, you'll probably get some nervous looks and perhaps not a straight answer. The reason for this is that in the first year or two of Homestuck's existence, the readers themselves had no idea what Homestuck was about, and they're nervous that telling you what Homestuck's about will spoil too much of the charm. I, however, am not of this mindset, and I'm going to tell you right now very clearly what Homestuck is about. Homestuck is a story about the propagation of existence itself. It's a story as ambitious in scale as it is in its own presentation. Many will say that Homestuck has excellent world building, but that's kind of selling it short. Homestuck does have some excellent world building, in the form of the trolls and their culture. However, that is just a chunk of the story. Homestuck itself has an entire mythology. It's a creation myth, and the scope of that creation is bigger than any single civilization, planet, or universe that exists within it. The mythology is slowly and deliberately developed over the course of the story, and the reader has to really think and pay attention to get the full picture. Personally, I've gone back and reread from the beginning at least three times since the series has started, and I don't think I could have written this if not for doing so. Homestuck is structurally complicated, and will sometimes seem downright belligerent towards the reader in its presentation, but that chaotic presentation does have a thematic purpose, as we'll see by the end of this, and if the reader can look beyond that, they'll find a narrative which is incredibly rewarding in every single way you'd want a story to be. Many have expressed some fears that new readers will have a hard time following events if they're blasting through the pages quickly and not forced to wait and think, and I think there's probably some truth to this. So my opinion is that by having a framework for what's going on prior to reading, your experience with Homestuck will be less frustrating, and you won't have to do as much digging around wiki pages to catch things you missed. However, before we get started developing that framework, we need to develop a framework for developing that framework. With that in mind, I am now going to take a cue from one of the professionals, Mr. Betone, by launching into a seemingly unrelated tangent for several minutes. It's time to learn about object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming is a set of design paradigms, which together compose a way of thinking that can help in the creation and organization of large pieces of software. The idea is this. Everything in the universe, including the universe itself and whatever contains the universe, is an object. All objects have different methods or functions, that's things they can do, and properties, things that belong to them. Disclaimer, this design philosophy is one of many. However, it is without a doubt one of the two or three most popular, and not without good reason. Object-oriented programming very naturally breaks a complex problem down into more manageable chunks, and arguably adheres to the engineering design process better than any other. It's also extremely nice in how naturally it conforms to modular design. When programming with this paradigm in mind, one doesn't create objects directly. Instead, one creates a class. Essentially, a class is a blueprint for a generic version of some object. For example, one might create the car class, which would have properties that all cars have, such as four wheels and an engine as well as shared methods such as ignition and brake. Then, somewhere else in the program, when one needs to create a car object, they call a special method inside called a constructor, which constructs, or more technically instantiates, the object from the instructions in the class. Methods, like any functions in math, can take inputs and use those in whatever it is they do, and the constructor is no exception. The constructor can take inputs, which can be used to make instances of an object specialized and different from one another. In this car example, these are used to set the make, model, license plate number, etc. Through feeding different inputs to the constructor, multiple unique car objects can be created from a single car blueprint. 
This in itself is a very modular way to program, but it gets even better. After making a car class, we can get even more specific. We could, for instance, create individual classes for every make and model of car, and have those new classes inherit all of the properties and methods from the parent car class. Let's say that our child classes are bus, taxi, convertible, tractor, and limousine. What is convenient about inheritance is that there's no need to reprogram our original methods like ignition or brake. Those are there already. Instead, I can focus on programming new properties and methods which are unique to each of the children class. For example, I could give the convertible a retract hood method, or give the limousine a bar with an extra bartender property, or give the bus a stop sign method. Giving each of the children unique constructor methods can allow for multiple convertibles to even distinguish themselves from one another, as that is where it could take the property inputs such as license plate number, color, make, model, etc. And the inheritance doesn't need to stop here either. I could even define new subclasses of the tractor or bus, or make the car class a subclass of a more abstract vehicle class. These kinds of hierarchies are common and allow a programmer to attach new functionality onto a program as easily as attaching Lego bricks to each other. Now, let's talk about horns. All cars have horns that they can honk. It would be natural to give the base car class a function called honk horn. However, perhaps the bus and the tractor have different sounding horns. We can choose not to write any code at all in the car class for honk horn. Instead, we can wait and write the details of how the horn is honked and what the sound is like in the children classes. To clarify, the car class has a honk horn method, as well as all of its children classes. They all do. When the honk horn method is called from, say, a bus, the program will move up the inheritance tree and pick the first honk horn method that it finds that has actual code in it. This means that the bus's honk horn method will override the car's version of it, and the result is something similar but different. What is nice about this is that I can have the rest of my program assume that all cars have a honk horn method but I can leave the implementation of that method to more specific children classes. This idea, the idea of redefining and altering functionality in a way that makes a program context sensitive, is called polymorphism. And if you've already read Homestuck and are being reminded of Esperb's hyperadaptability, how its various systems manifest from game to game in similar but different ways, then you're on the right track. So, what does that mean? It means context sensitive. It's sensitive. To context. Try over there. Okay. The last concept for modulating programming that I want to discuss is that of encapsulation. But in order to do this, I'm going to lose the car example and shift gears a bit, and instead say a bit about how computers are actually designed. Here's an obvious fact. Computers are complicated. The processor that you're using right now to watch this video is made out of no less than a few billion transistors. How do you design something like that? The answer? object-oriented thinking. Sure, computers are made from billions of transistors, but we can simplify the problem by noting that we're pretty much just repeating the same five or six types of arrangements of two or three transistors each over and over again, and arranging those in fancy ways. If we know this, why not just let a factory produce those five or six arrangements and put them in little boxes for us? Then we can work with those instead of transistors, and now are only dealing with a few hundred million objects instead of several billion. In industry lingo, we have risen up by one layer of abstraction and are now working at the logic level. A few hundred million is still pretty complicated, though. But wait! These logic gates are just being used in the same two dozen or so arrangements over and over again. So, we can do the same thing. Have someone else make the multiplexers, adders, decoders, and so forth out of the logic gates, and then work with those. Now we're in business. Do you see what's happening here? This isn't object-oriented programming yet. But if we kept dumping things in boxes for a while longer and rose up two or three more layers, it actually would be. More importantly, this is object-oriented thinking, and with any complex system, this not only helps to break a problem down, but it also naturally adds stability to our design. If we hide something in a box and expect people to use it without opening the box, then we need to add holes to the box, some kind of interface which lets other objects use it. This limits the number of potential ways that one can break something. Think of it this way. If I hadn't put the thing in the box, then I'd have been left with what's inside, in this example, a circuit. Observe that now I can connect wires to a lot more places than I could when I was using the box. This means that I now have that many more ways to potentially fuck something up. It's not just simpler if I use the box, it's better. The box is safe. The box is your friend. And when someone talks to you about this kind of security enforced by hiding or simplifying of information, they're talking about encapsulation, something that you were already doing if you were using object-oriented programming. Okay, that's enough of a tangent for now. Is anyone still here?
Now it's time to start to lay out Homestuck's mythology and apply this line of thinking we've developed wherever possible. Picture a fish tank. Inside the fish tank is infinite nothingness. This blank canvas of nothing is called void. Despite being vast and empty, the void has inhabitants. The void is inhabited by massive, horrible, squid-like, Lovecraftian tentacle monsters called horror terrors. Despite their appearances, these creatures are actually quite benign. At least somewhat intelligent, they have their own culture, customs, and agenda, one which is never made entirely clear to the reader and in classic Lovecraftian style is likely impossible or a very bad idea for humans to truly understand. Despite this, these creatures are really just fish in a tank. Going on the fish analogy, these fish occasionally glub bubbles in the void. These bubbles are vacuums in which space can exist. If you're familiar at all with how an operating system segments off memory, this would be akin to the creation of a process space. A process space is a chunk of memory that an operating system will segment off and reserve for running programs. I tend to think of the relationship between space and void as being akin to unused memory versus memory that's reserved, not necessarily used, just reserved, for potential data or operations. By these definitions, both space and void are technically the same thing, but space is more regulated. In particular, the passage of time is a feature that space has over void. Thinking of time as a feature might sound strange at first, but in a computer, processing takes time, and so the processor is only going to pay attention to the designated spaces it's reserved for stuff to happen. If the processor isn't paying attention to something, it might as well not exist, so outside of space, time is at best muddled and at worst non-existent. Going back to the glubbed up bubbles, this space will be hopefully used for something, and when that thing is done, the bubble will pop. Most of the time, that's the end of it. The process is halted and that space is again merged with the void. Occasionally, however, the bubble will pop, and where the bubble used to be, a smaller bubble will be found, one containing a very special frog. This guy is called the Genesis Frog, and shortly after the pop, we'll initiate what is called the Vast Croak. The Vast Croak is not just a spin on the Big Bang, although it is also that. It's more specifically a take on the constructor of a class being executed. This is how universe objects are instantiated within the void. One important thing to note, however, is that the frog doesn't create the universe. He quite literally becomes the encapsulation of a universe. If you want in or out of a universe, you have to go through this frog. The frog is the box, and off the top of my head, I can only think of two ways to effectively travel in or out, and two ways to communicate with its inhabitants. So now we have some layers of abstraction, just like with our computer design. Civilizations exist within universes, which are created inside of bubbles. These bubbles have limited access to and communication with other bubbles, and all of this is contained in a fish tank called Paradox Space. Do you see the boxes? We have boxes within boxes which can communicate and work with each other through a set interface with established means of communication. From a computer science standpoint, this is to make the entire system more, and, and don't laugh at my word here, believable. By believable, I mean that as a piece of software, the objects in Homestuck's mythology are arranged in a way that makes the system stable and dependable. While I can't claim that Homestuck has a world map, I'm confident that most readers have a layout in their heads of the connecting lines between the all the major areas. I can say this with confidence because there simply aren't that many of them. As an example, if you've read Homestuck, think back to the ways in which one can travel between a game session and Earth. How many can you think of? There are only two. The Sky Defense System and the Transportalizer in the Frog Temple. Not only that, but in the case of the Sky Defense System, the time when that travel is possible, as well as the destinations, are predetermined. And in the case of the transportalizers, they're set in fixed locations, with only two leading to Earth and both terminating at the same place. Thinking back to what we now know about object-oriented programming, and remembering what we said about encapsulation, you can hopefully agree with me when I say that this is good software design. And every other line of travel and communication is also like this. The planet and the game session started by a civilization on that planet are closely linked, but the communication and dependencies between those two objects is effectively minimized. There's only one way to travel and two ways to communicate between universes. Travel between areas in Homestuck outside of these established means is possible, but only through brute force, the prime example being the three years it takes to get from you-know-where to you-know-what. Another place where encapsulation becomes an important consideration is with the situation of the character Snowman. Since talking about that would spoil too much, I won't go into details here, but I wanted to point out that thinking about that particular situation in terms of encapsulation could help in understanding it a little better, and I encourage viewers who have read the story to do so. Now that we have a general layout in place, we can discuss the question that Homestuck aims to answer. Where did the frog come from? 
The answer is that the Genesis Frog was slash is slash will be created in a closed, stable time loop, a massively advanced and convoluted system of propagation. There's no catalyst to the propagation. Every universe is and was created by another universe, and there is no first universe. Likely the way it works is circular. Whichever universe you view as the first has a line of descendants which can eventually be traced all the way around to the universe which will eventually create it. Within the void, time and space are convoluted. So to examine how this system works, Hussey picks our universe, the one containing Earth, as an arbitrary starting point and shows us how it contributes to the creation of another. Pick a planet in our universe with intelligent life. Eventually this life form will become advanced enough to excavate code from some ruins with a conspicuous frog's effigy on it. It's guaranteed to be there. This code is written on the walls in a language that, once deciphered and translated, will be programmable into that species' version of computers. How can the wall writing be that specific? Why is it guaranteed to be on that specific planet? The answer? Polymorphism. Every universe has these ruins in some facet. The implementations, however, are context sensitive. What the wall writing actually is, is the source code for a video game. This video game comes in the form of two pieces of codependent software, which work together to create a shared experience between two players. The name of the game will vary from species to species. In the case of humans, it's called Esperb, and its two components are labeled server and client. Shortly after the game is produced, that planet will be destroyed by meteors, and the race will be seemingly annihilated. In truth, however, two or more young members of that race that are playing the game at the time of impact will be, hopefully, transported into a new bubble different from the one their universe exists in. At this point, let's reconsider the horror terrors. Beyond the Lovecraftian unknowableness of them, I might be willing to hazard a guess that their primary function is similar to that of daemons in an operating system. Before I explain what daemons are, let me explain what the kernel is. The kernel is the guts of an operating system. It's the medium by which high-level software can communicate with low-level hardware interactions and data processing. It also assigns memory to running processes and handles multithreading, which is essentially how much processing time is dedicated to each process and in what order. The kernel does much of this work through the use of non-interactive background processes called daemons. Daemons are essentially the kernel's servants, and thinking of the horror terrors as analogous to this would be consistent with all of the major functions that the horror terrors seem to have, such as creating spaces and facilitating networks of communication as we later see with dream bubbles. This would also explain where the furthest ring gets its name. It's referring to the outermost layer of abstraction that readers are supposed to be aware of in the mythology of Homestuck. I say all this now because if there's a point where we just have to stop asking questions, it's with the horror terrors. And it's an effective place to cap the lore as well, since given their Lovecraftian unknowableness, there's an actual thematic reason for readers to believe they aren't supposed to see that far. I'd like to take some time now to discuss a bit how Esperb works. Like any piece of software, it's installed on computers, and as I said before, there are two components, server and client. The server version of the game is to be installed on one computer, while the client is installed on another, and through an internet connection, these are connected to make a multiplayer game. The breakdown is as follows. The player that installs the client is essentially the player character, the one inside the game, while the server is the player themselves, viewing their friend inside their house and given functionality over their house in a manner similar to The Sims. In this manner, Esperb is Hussey's excuse for adding video game abstractions to the supposedly normal world that the story starts in. I say normal in sarcasm quotes because there is of course one abstraction that's present from the beginning. I'm of course talking about the inventory system. The inventory system itself is presented as a frustrating parody of overly convoluted inventory systems with increasingly arcane methods of retrieving items. However, through the comedy of the situations, the reader is actually subtly being given lessons on data structures. John's and Dave's inventories are made out of an array, while Rose's inventory is made out of a linked list. Arrays and linked lists together make up the fundamental building block data structures, in that all of the others can be constructed out of those two. Linked lists are essentially packets of data, with each packet containing something of interest, as well as a pointer which connects it to another object in the list. In blunt contrast, arrays are just big chunks of data that are segmented into equally sized boxes, which are, in memory, all right next to one another. John's inventory is an array where access is modeled by as a queue, which is just a line where the last object stored is the first one to be retrieved. Later this is reversed from last in first out to first in last out, but it's the same concept either way. Rose has a tree, which is essentially a last in first out queue, but branching in different directions, and Dave has a hash table, which is an array where access is determined by a search method called the hashing function. Most of the comedy here comes from these characters coping with their inventory's individual drawbacks and pitfalls. 
all data structures have their own pros and cons, and through seeing all three of these being used to accomplish the same basic task, the reader is effectively shown what these are. John's queue is built out of an array, which is a fixed size and prone to overflow errors. Rose's tree inventory, being made from a linked list, has the advantage over arrays of having no fixed size. New objects can be created and attached as long as the computer has memory. Rose is also able to pull any leaves without consequence, giving her theoretically more items to pick from at any given moment. However, trees are prone to balancing issues if there isn't some sort of algorithm dictating what branch new leaves should be attached to, and pulling an item from any further up from than the bottom severs the link that the leaves would have with the rest of the tree. Dave's hash table has plenty of space for objects, but is subject to the whim of the hashing function. Dave didn't exactly make the wisest choice of hashing functions, and he's left with a table which doesn't always cooperate with him. Together, these three characters' adventures in managing their inventories and eventually getting the hang of them give the reader a moderately effective lecture on arrays, linked lists, queues, trees, and hash tables. Most of the fundamental data structures they would learn about in a college class without them even realizing it. It's quite impressive. The inventory management system present in the story has a big payoff, even beyond the data structure lessons. When characters realize the cards representing objects in their inventories are not gaming abstractions, but in fact actual physical objects with codes on the back representing them in a database somewhere. The server player is given some special objects to deploy in the client's home. There are many of these, and each has a history lesson to teach about computer technology throughout the ages. Most obvious of this is punch card programmable machinery, which can be used to craft new cards or combine previous ones by laying holes on top of one another. To get the cards punched, though, they must first enter in the code into a machine which takes the card and punches a code onto it, which makes it readable by machines, albeit unusable. This punched card can then be combined with other punched cards to create combined and more powerful items. This all combines to create a system of duplicating and combining items that functions as a crafting system throughout the story. I don't really know what's up with the Cruxite lathes, which function in between the punched cards and actual item creation, but punch card based computing is an idea credited to a guy named Gottfried Leibniz. He was a German mathematician who lived in the 17th century, who was arguably the first to come up with the idea for a machine which would read instructions and perform tasks based on those instructions. He never got it done, though. That idea would later come into fruition in the 19th century with Charles Babbage's Difference Engine, which could read punch cards representing polynomials and perform steps of Newton's method on them to approximate zeros. The inventory and crafting system combined serve to highlight the first primary purpose of Esperb in the story of Homestuck, which is to be a tutorial of sorts to the reader. Through watching characters being forced to interact with the arcane systems Esper presents to them, readers are being subconsciously primed on the workings of computers, learning about data structures, and being shown a smaller scale model of what computers actually are once those screens and peripherals are stripped away. By around the middle of Act 3, inventory management and crafting systems become much less prevalent, and the inventory systems start to become one-off jokes rather than anything worth thinking about. But by that point, they've served their purpose, that purpose being to move the reader towards thinking about Homestuck in terms of computers. To reinforce my claim that this is a tutorial to the reader, keep in mind that most of this is done prior to Act 3, and it's not until then that the reader actually starts learning about the bigger picture of what's going on. Readers have to literally play through this tutorial to get to the rest of the game. The other major function of the Esperb interface is to instantiate the actual game that the characters will be playing in. The character's first task is to create a special object which essentially acts as a trigger to call a constructor and instantiate the world that they'll be transported to inside of a new medium. It's here that the game really begins to be played, and it's also here that polymorphism starts to rear its head in some major ways. There are many things that any instance of the game will have. The general layout and overall objectives will always be the same from game to game, with players using es the Esperb interface to build up each other's houses towards the location of an eventual final battle, all the while fulfilling objectives on their own planets. I'll go into more details on the mechanics of the game and how those mechanics influence the quality of the story in part two, but for now, suffice to say, there is a game class at work here, with set properties and methods that will always be there. How those properties and methods will be implemented, however, is polymorphic. The game space is actually the product of multiple constructor methods, as many as there are players, each creating a single planet and updating the game in various ways. The players themselves, as well as optionally their kernel sprite companion, are fed into the constructor as inputs, and the planet that's created, as well as the contents of that update, including new enemy types and lore, are dependent on that input. The planet and mythological role assigned to the player entering is a direct result of their personality, hobbies, and history, all of which is fed into the game with their entry and calling of the constructor. 
In this way, the game is hyper-adaptive, with a story, world-building, prophecies, and drama that conform uniquely to every group of players that enter. The way this is presented is one of the primary draws of Homestuck, and without hyperbole, I'll say that it's one of the most unique and interesting things I have ever seen in a story. Not to mention appealing. The mere idea of being sucked into a game tailor-made for you and your friends sounds amazing to me. Homestuck manages to incorporate multiple sessions of the game into its narrative, and through that we can see just how adaptable the game is to different inputs. A good example of this is the NPC characters. A game session always has a generic good guy and bad guy townsfolk and villagers to help or kill, but in addition there will always be several templates for certain NPC characters of interest, which will always be involved in a game session, but their involvement completely depends on the story that develops once things have started. One particular Durst agent serves as a valuable ally in one game session and a dangerous antagonist in another, and these outcomes were primarily due simply to just cultural differences between the different alien races playing the game. There are dozens of little touches like this one, and if you've ever wondered why the narrative lingered so long on pre-entry shenanigans with each of the kids, this is the reason. Knowing the characters' tendencies, problems, interests, and mannerisms before seeing them enter the game makes seeing the world developed around them more appreciable. John's entry in particular took place at a time where story commands were largely given by readers, which gave us a feeling that we had in some facets that created and seeded the story ourselves, which is a nice little bonus. And none of this is to say that the lore of a single game session couldn't hold up on its own. Each of them is unique and interesting. The intrigue of Homestuck comes just as much from the lore of each individual game session as it does from the ways that they're all connected. This entire concept of hyper-adaptability is brought to a climax of sorts with what winning the game inevitably accomplishes. Throughout the player's adventures, they'll gradually assemble genetic material using instruments provided by the Esper interface and eventually create a Genesis Frog of their own. Winning the game entails creating and securing a home for an entire universe that's tailor-made for the players who won, to reside over it as gods. This is brilliant, because up to that point of the reveal, the reader has seen for thousands of pages how the kids, with their interests, personalities, and personal conflicts, have left their own unique influence in the game world. The payoff is the revelation that this influence is not just for flavoring the experience, it's used to actually create something. The entire point of the game's hyper-adaptive prophecies and mythology is to record the cultural imprint of the most capable civilization that a universe has to offer, and create a means by which that universe can pass this on as favorable genetic material to its offspring. As a narrative payoff, this is huge, and as a sci-fi idea, it's fucking awesome. All of this, by the way, is foreshadowed as early as Act 1, in the player's online screen names of all things. All of them are two-word names with starting letters that are either A, C, T, or G. These are, of course, short for adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, the four nucleotide bases of a DNA strand. This reveal also retroactively answers two questions that most readers probably didn't even realize warranted an answer. Those two questions are, why a game? And why kids? Well, the reason that this process pivots around a game, as opposed to anything else, is the fact that a game has to be won. This ensures that only the most capable and advantageous genetic material is ever used in a family line. The reason it's children that are chosen to play as opposed to adults is that children are naive and will likely hold their civilization to more of an idealized and romanticized regard, increasing the probability that the traits of a civilization that are passed on are positive ones, or at the very least, ones which reflect on that civilization most favorably. This kind of fridge brilliance is one of Hussey's calling cards, and it's an example of how he'll often use the silly presentation of his story in order to surprise his readers. There's lots of things in Homestuck which will come off at first as unimportant joke fodder, but turn out to be plot-central ideas later on. I might even be willing to claim that everything in Homestuck is actually like this. If you're starting to believe me now that Homestuck can be viably thought of as a piece of software, let's ask the next question. What kind of computer is running it? I claim that the computer running the software that is Homestuck's multiverse is in fact a quantum computer. I would be completely out of my depth trying to explain how quantum computers work, but that didn't stop me from making the rest of this video, so I guess here goes. Classical computers operate on sequences of bits, objects that are either 0 or 1, manipulating them and moving them around to produce particular arrangements which can be interpreted as the solution to whatever problem the algorithm was trying to solve. Quantum computers instead act on sequences of qubits, which are in a quantum superposition between 0 and 1 until measured, with a probability distribution associated with which of the two numbers would be found for each entry in the sequence, typically referred to as a wave function. Without going too heavily into wave functions or superpositions, one way to interpret this is that the qubits are essentially arranged in every possible configuration at once until measured, at which point the wave function collapses to a static result. 
Quantum algorithms work by repeatedly taking all of these configurations at once and then collapsing the wave function to a specific one with a high probability of being a good one, which it will take to the next step. In the mythology of Homestuck, paradox space has multiple timelines acting in unison with one another. At any moment, these timelines are breaking away in an infinite number of different directions, meaning there are an infinite number of different versions of the same thing happening at the same time. However, only one of these timelines is going to be chosen as the desired result of whatever the intended goal was. Because of this, all but one of these timelines is doomed the instant they are created, in the sense that they are abandoned by the processor and will inevitably get deleted by the garbage collector, a background process which deletes data that is no longer being used. This single correct timeline in the story is known to the characters as the alpha timeline, and in this quantum computer framework, it can be thought of as the output once the program is finished, or at least the timeline which is most on track towards achieving whatever output is desired. There's definitely more to say here. I believe in particular that the aspects of doom and mind are closely linked to the quantum computing side of Homestuck's mythology, but since this video is getting kind of long, I think I'm going to pause that discussion here until part two. I'll leave it at this, though. There's an unproven conjecture in physics which supposes that any physical system can be simulated by a quantum computer. I think one could say that this conjecture is the primary science fiction premise that Homestuck's lore is built around. It assumes this is true and runs with this idea to show off a program which models all of existence. At this point, I had planned to try to make a diagram visualizing this process and summarizing everything we've talked about so far. That diagram quickly deteriorated into pseudocode, and that pseudocode quickly deteriorated into something which was kind of shit, but here it is. Let's be clear here. I am not a programmer. My field is mathematics. Given how natural it felt for me to diagram Homestuck this way, having not coded anything in years other than latex files, I'd love to see what an actual experienced programmer could pull off. I hope that I've convinced you, if nothing else, that there is some validity to thinking of Homestuck as a piece of software. And with that, I'm putting out an open call to any programmers watching this. Diagram Homestuck. Do a better job than I did. If you do, and I like it, I'll find a way to shove it into this video somewhere. Hold on, though, before doing that, because I'm not quite done droning on yet. Let's back up a bit. And not a bit. Probably up a lot. Remember the frog ruins? How did the frog ruins get there? The answer is, similar to the question of how the universe got there, circular. If it's there, that means it will be put there in the future. Its existence in the present triggers the future events which will put it there. But it was put there in the present due to those future events. It is like, not kidding, hundreds of other things in Homestuck, a time paradox. Hence the name for the fish tank, Paradox Space. There's no explicit reason for the existence of stable time loops. In the mythology of Homestuck, loops seem to exist as a fundamental property or consequence of nature, like void and space. I say natural in the sense that it's treated as a phenomenon that is as futile a question as gravity or electricity. It's simply the way of things, something to be accepted and used. Like many of the ideas in Homestuck, stable time loops will at first appear to the reader as convoluted and unnecessary, but when viewed as a creation myth, they're an absolutely beautiful construction, a very pretty idea, and most importantly, masterfully executed. The time shenanigans in Homestuck are one of its most impressive features, simply because Hussey managed to juggle it all so well. Just about every single minuscule object seen in the comic has some sort of arc in the story if you're looking closely, as is showcased by one object in particular, and then later one-upped by an enormous margin by another. If you've read the story, then you know which ones I'm talking about, and if you don't, then I won't spoil them. Rest assured, I dare you to not go back with a pad of paper and a pencil to try and piece it all together once the tarp is raised on those particular plot points. The idea of time loops as a naturally occurring phenomenon is as good a segue as any to discuss the duality that Homestuck achieves between natural order and man-made order. I've been discussing the mythology of Homestuck as a piece of software, which I believe is completely intentional. However, if I was more knowledgeable about biology, I'll bet that I could with equal validity recontextualize much of what I just said in terms of ecosystems. I compared paradox space to a fish tank intentionally, the fish-like horror terrors that inhabit it and facilitate its development and evolution, the cherubs acting as a universal immune system, the genetic programming associated with creating a genesis frog, the terrible fish puns. All of this and more combines to make Homestuck's multiverse feel like some kind of crazy primordial soup as much as it does as a computer program. And for the record, I think that the fish tank metaphor could easily be substituted for one of a liquid-cooled computer tower, with the green sun acting as its power supply. I used the ecosystem interpretation instead to reinforce the point that there is a duality at work here, and the influence of computer science, while still a large part of it, is not the full picture of its mythology. It's undeniable that the mythology of Homestuck is extremely rigidly ordered, but that ordering seems to harmonize two conflicting versions of itself. I think that part of what makes Homestuck's lore so appealing to think about is that harmony it achieves between mathematical construction and natural fluidity.
That is a top-down overview of the mythology that Homestuck exists in, presented in the framework of computer science to the best of my abilities. You may not agree with some of the points I made, and that's okay, because I have a hard time believing that anyone will disagree with all of them. Assuming that, I think that I've succeeded in providing a fairly convincing argument for computer science having a major influence on the story. I at least hope I did, because I can say with relative confidence that fantasy world-building based on modern software design paradigms and computer theory is something that would be completely unique to Homestuck if true. Computer science is just as many parts philosophy and math as it is actual science. It's a collection of ideas on how to design and organize large systems in a way that's stable, efficient, and manageable. This shows through to make Homestuck's particular flavor of world-building feel more philosophical and idea-based than something that's purely fantasy or purely sci-fi. It underscores the very human compulsion to create order out of chaos, which is a theme that's reflected everywhere in Homestuck, from the contrast between its rigidly ordered lore and its chaotically fragmented presentation, to the central conflict in which a rampaging virus tears down those systems as quickly as they're explained, to the determination that the readers themselves feel from trying to piece the story together as they read. This is not just novelty for the sake of it. It's world building with a purpose. It's one of the things which makes Homestuck truly special, and I think that it's something that deserves recognition and commendation. And despite the fact that I've spent over 30 minutes now talking about it, this topic isn't the only thing that makes the story special. Not even close. Hussey's knowledge base for crafting the lore and story of Homestuck is truly impressive. Readers can find not just references to, but explorations of concepts ranging from computer science, biology, chemistry, quantum mechanics, classical literature, video games, anime, LARPing, card games, business models, finance, bad movies, sociology, mathematics, internet culture, and a multitude of other topics. These topics aren't only hit on for laughs. All of them ask and attempt to answer questions that you can tell Hussey himself was quite interested in as he wrote them into the story. I can make video after video discussing each of these topics, and I definitely plan to continue doing so, but I would never be done. Homestuck feels like a big melting pot of ideas, all the ideas, and it achieves this feeling in the most difficult way possible, by literally introducing them to the story one by one. In this way, reading Homestuck feels like watching an insane juggler keep balls in the air as new ones are being periodically thrown into the mix, except the objects he's juggling are philosophical concepts, pop culture artifacts, and scientific theory. Occasionally he'll mess up and drop a ball or two, but that doesn't take anything away from the sheer spectacle of the show as a whole. And best of all, this is all accomplished without making any sacrifices to the more human side of the story. The principal cast of two dozen or so characters is, at least to me, completely unforgettable, with several of my all-time favorites in all of fiction. It's the best kind of character development, the kind that starts out understated and gradually sneaks up on you. Homestuck is often criticized for its length, and I'm not going to stand here and try to convince you that it isn't quite long. However, I would like to say that most of the comments on its length are pretty overblown, Yes, it is thousands of pages, however, most of these pages are just still images or gifs, ranging between 2 and 10 seconds to digest and move on. Treated like a book, Homestuck is comparable in length to a fantasy series such as Game of Thrones or the Harry Potter series. Think of it this way, and it isn't nearly as intimidating when someone tells you the page count. It's also divided into seven acts, with a mostly up-to-date table of contents to help give the reader a sense of where they are and where they're going. It has a built-in bookmark system, which works assuming you have cookies enabled in your browser. It has wonderful and often hilariously written prose. It also has some of the most satisfying delivery you could ask for, with each climactic moment topping the last in sheer hype and scale that would give a grin log and a run for its money. You have all the tools you need to have a breezy and enjoyable time reading Homestuck, so go do it. I'd like to give a heartfelt thanks and congratulations to anyone who sat through this entire video and hope that everybody got something out of it. In the next part, I'll be talking about the more video gamey elements of Homestuck and how those elements serve to reinforce its narrative. A large part of that will be a discussion of the class and aspect system. Part 3 will be about troll culture, and focus heavily on the character Briska. Part 4 will be about the villain, and will focus on the more meta-narrative side of things, and from there I'm not really sure. See you then.